I've already told you that Alexander Pope was a landscape architect, a man intimately involved in art and aesthetics of buildings and of the land in his lifetime. He also conceptualized a very broad-based work called The Essay on Man, which was to include all aspects of human life. He was to discuss women, the characters of men. He was going to discuss architecture and poetry. The epistle to Arbuthnot gives us poetry. The epistle to Burlington is his tribute to art, architecture, and aesthetics. On April 4th, 1731, Alexander, poem, uh, Alexander Pope sent this poem with a letter to Richard Boyle, 3rd Earl of Burlington, and on 13 December 1731, he published the poem. Burlington had published a book on the architecture of the Renaissance architect Andreas Palladio, and Pope's poem had to do, you see, with taste. And this is his title page of Taste and Epistle to the Right Honorable Richard Earl of Burlington by Mr. Pope. But when he chose to produce it again in uh, January 4 or 6, he had a different way of looking at his poem. And the title page shows you that he's not dealing with of taste, but he's dealing with false taste. Now, sites alluded to in this poem are to be found in Norfolk, where we find Horace Walpole's Houghton, where we find Bridges Cannons, and also within that belt of Middlesex and Buckinghamshire, where the River Thames flows from London, past Kensington Palace, past Twitnam, where Pope's home was, over to Hampton Court, where the Queens live. This is a map of England of near London. This is London. The Thames flows from London, the large city heavily populated, through until it becomes a purling stream near Alexander Pope's home. Now, when you look at this poem, you have to understand that we are writing and studying Horatian epistles. Pope considered the essay on man and all the subsequent works to be Horatian in nature. And one of the works that he draws from is Horace's Ad Numisium. This happens to be from a beautifully designed book by the Renaissance artist Aldous. And this particular poem, Ad Numisius, or Tu Numisius, is one source for Pope's attack in this poem on the vulgar rich. It's a work, it is a work that Pope contemplated for many years. The epistle begins with an attack upon the love of material wealth and the ignorance of sublime reaches. He says, admire we then what earth's low entrails hold. The 1738 imitation sustains Pope's attack against the ministry and against immoral power. The poem further states, Ad Numisius, that the ignorant and the vulgar rich must hire sycophants to praise their taste and support their excesses. In many instances, those hired to provide taste offer the only route that these men have to achieve understanding and virtue. Thomas Maresca, in a book called Pope's Horatian Poems, talks about Pope's religious protest. He says much of his poetry is an attack, a Christian homily against sin, against excesses, against the deadly sins. 
The other of Horace's works that Pope copies in this particular poem is to add Fuscus Aristium. Aristius Fuscus. And this offers a sense of the peace and serenity in the country. It announces the virtues of the country, of the gardens, and in a positive manner, it provides a statement of moderation that we must learn from nature. Where the grass smells finer and shines more than African mosaics, says Horace in this poem. He asks this question in the poem. Is the water purer that pounds its way through the pipes in the city than that which scampers and murmurs along our sloping streams. Pope's home at Twickenham had a grotto in a hillside underneath it, near, uh, under the foundation, and he would sit in it and look over his gardens across the Thames, which at that point is a rather narrow, purling stream. Finally, Horace comments in these poems and in Aristus, uh, uh, Aristius Fuscus. He says, Shun bigness. Your humble estate may offer the chance to outpace kings and the friends of kings as you dance your way along life. The poem itself is a catalog of 18th century aesthetics. And I want to show you some of the lines from the poem and what Pope tells us. All right, we'll be there in just a minute. They are in much older poetry, girl. Yeah, thank you. All right. Pope begins the poem by saying, "'Tis strange the miser should his cares employ to gain those riches he can ne'er enjoy. Is it less strange the prodigal should waste his wealth to purchase what he ne'er can taste? Not for himself he sees or hears or eats. Artists must choose his pictures, music, meats. He buys for topmen, Drawings and designs for Pembroke, statues, dirty gods, and coins. Rare monkish manuscripts for her and alone, and books for Mead, and butterflies for Sloan. So it's the historian Hearn who provides him with books, and it is Sloan who provides them with butterflies. Now what do we mean by that? Here you have a picture of Walt Thomas Hearn's history of the kings of England, Edward I, Edward II, and Edward III. Hearn was an historian. And you would need historians who would buy books for these wealthy people who themselves hardly read. What does Pope mean when he talks about butterflies for Sloan? Hans Sloan founded the British Museum. And these are actual butterflies from the British Museum. They look as though they are moths. They look like moths, but you have to remember that England has a cold climate and butterflies have to learn, had, had to learn to protect themselves. But if you went to the British Museum, you would find Sloan's butterflies there, as I had found them.
Pope goes on to write in this poem, Heaven visits with a taste the wealthy fool and needs no rod but Ripley with a rule. Now, what does that mean, Ripley with a rule? This is an attack on Robert Walpole, the Prime Minister of England, whose corruption allowed him to build a $2 million estate with public funds. Ripley was Walpole's architect. He says, see, sport of fate to punish awkward pride bids Bubo build and sends him such a guide, a standing sermon at each year's expense that never cucks come reached magnificence. And here is Horace Walpole's home. What you see here are the stables and the main house and other stables. Now notice it looks somewhat like our School of Architecture. The University of Houston School of Architecture is actually modeled after an 18th century office building uh, designed by a man by the name of Lenotra. But the design looks Palladian. Instead of domes on the top of our School of Architecture, we have a Greek lantern. And we don't have statues of heroic figures there. But I suppose if we did place statues of heroic figures on top of these buildings, as Palladio did and as architects did in the 18th century, we would probably have the chancellor and the quarterback of the football team, people who perform heroically for the University of Houston. Now, notice this home that Walpole had. It's a very large home. And this is his estate. Now, if you look at this little item here, three little boxes, sort of, that is his home, the one I just showed you. The rest are lakes, agricultural gardens, orangeries, where oranges were grown. It's a magnificent estate. The one time someone described it as a Brobden Nagian estate. So Pope sets his battle lines first, and he tries to understand what it is that is good architecture and what it is that is grandiose, grandiose architecture, pompous in its presentation. He doesn't like Walpole, and he uses Ripley as his source of reflection. Pope writes to Burlington, You show us Rome was glorious, not profuse, and pompous buildings once were things of use. Castles you built for kings and queens. Fine ar ar pieces of architecture you built for churches and fine office buildings. Very much unlike Saddam Hussein in Iraq, who built multiple palaces to glorify his own being. Pope would have disdained and written adversarial and satirical poetry about such palaces. He says, Yet shall my lord, your just, your noble rules, fill half the land with imitating fools, who random drawings from your sheets shall take and of one beauty, many blunders make. So while you're a good architect, other architects imitating you might not prove themselves as good as you are. He says, some will turn arcs of triumph to a garden gate, reverse your ornaments, and hang them all on some patched dog hole etched with ends of wall. Then they will clap four slices of pilaster on it that laced with bits of rusk, rustic makes a front. He goes on at the bottom to say, these poets conscious they act a true, but, but most people, proud people, good architects, are conscious to act a true Palladian part 
And if they starve, they starve by rules of art. So bad poets will make themselves rich. I mean, bad architects will make themselves rich. Good architects may not get as many contracts, but they will maintain their integrity. Pope goes on to say, oft have you hinted to your brother Pierre a certain truth which many buy too dear. Something there is more needful than expense and something previous even to taste. Tis sense. Good sense. Which only is the gift of heaven and though no science fairly worth the seven. If you're an artist, if you're an architect, if you're a landscape architect, you have to do things with good sense in mind. You have to follow patterns that are understandable. You can't be, you can't use flourishes and you can't use unnecessary decoration. He says, you must have a light which in yourself you must perceive. And then he says, Jones and Lenotra have it not to give. Now remember I told you about the Caesura? Does Jones like does Pope like Jones and Lenotra? If he says they have genius, they have a light, the poem would read this way. A light which in yourself you must perceive, Jones and Lenotra have it not to give. They have genius. You can't transfer genius to people. But if you don't like Jones and Lenotra, you will write, a light which in yourself you must perceive, Jones and Lenotra have it not. And that's where the Caesura goes at the not. Not to give. Well, the truth of the matter is that Pope liked Inigo Jones, the architect, and he liked Lenotra, who designed the Garden of Versailles. And this gives you some idea of the types of gardens that Pope liked. First of all, the designs of Inigo Jones were published during Pope's lifetime. And here are the gardens of Versailles. Notice the various patterns. Notice the trees planted in a quadrate here, they're square. Here are trees planted in triangles, or it looks like triangles. Actually, you have four trees with a tree in the middle. That's called a quincunx. We're going to talk about quincunxes in just a few moments. Right. Here is Versailles. Notice the beautiful gardens. Notice this kind of curve of bushes here. I looked at that one time and thought I would plant those bushes in my backyard exactly in that pattern. And then I discovered that there were 100 separate plants in that single planting alone to give it the curve, to give it the arch, to give it the flourish. And I wasn't about to spend that much money building a garden in my house in Houston. Pope writes in this poem, Behold Valerio's ten years' toil complete, his quincunx darkens, his espaliers meet. Now, I just mentioned to you that the quincunx is a set of trees that are planted in a quadrate, four in each corner and one in the middle, so that when these trees grew up, you would have a lot of shade. 
plus the five trees together gave you geometrical patterns much more interesting than planning in a quadrate. The idea of the quincunx actually came from the Roman army. When you had skilled Roman soldiers who fought in a quincunx, you would have four soldiers at each corner of a site and a spe an especially skillful soldier in the middle so that when the enemy came toward them, the four of the corners could ward off the enemy and the one in the middle moving in as many directions as you needed to do would catch any, any numbers of the enemy who might come into the quadrate. So Pope is celebrating the ability to think ahead and plant well. Behold, Valerio's ten years toil complete. His quincunx darkens. His espaliers meet. The wood supports the plain. The parts unite. And strength of shade contends with strength of light. So when you're an architect and a landscape architect, you're creating a garden that's going to let in the sunshine. You're going to create a garden that's going to give you shade in the summer heat. We have a landscape architect at the University of Houston who shapes our bushes as topiary. Sometimes they look like, like, like heaps of mushrooms. They're rather interesting. He also makes sure that this campus looks colorful in the rainy weather and in the heat of the summer. And if you want to study how to plant throughout the season in a tropical climate, you might discuss it with a university landscape architect. He says, a waving glow, the bloomy beds display, blushing in bright diversities of day. And as the sun rises, you get different patterns and different shades coming through the plantings and coming through the trees. You also have rivers running through this property with silver quivering rills meandered o'er. Enjoy them, you. Valario can no more. And here again you have the planting in the quincux on the top here and planting in the quadrate at the bottom of this design. And you can see that the quincunx gives you geometrical patterns of some interest, diamonds and crisscross shapes, and the quadrate doesn't give you quite that design. Pope, the architect, is always looking at the landscape. Pope talks about how you <clears throat> take bushes, let them grow thick, and then shape them into designs like peacocks, dragons, gladiators. Here's what he says in this poem. The suffering eye inverted nature sees. Trees cut to statues, statues thick as trees. He doesn't like as much artificial material in these gardens as others might like. With here a fountain never to be played and there a summer house that knows no shade. If you have a fountain on campus let the water flow but if you build a fountain and the piping is bad and it can flow all you have is an empty piece of metal standing on the landscape. With here a fountain never to be played and there a summer house that knows no shade. Some people just don't plant well. Here amphitrite sails through myrtle bowers. There gladiators fight or die in flowers. This is the topiary, the design. Unwatered see the drooping sea house morn and swallows roast in Nihilus's dusty urn classical imagery. Well, here's a garden from England, modern England. And notice the bushes shaped here. Over here you have a peacock design. And here you have more of a block, perhaps a centaur image. But no gladiators at this particular spot.
Pope says when you go into the homes of these very rich people, you're going to, dis you're going to discover that they put on affectations. In some cases, they're even phony. He says some of these very rich people have monumental libraries and bookcases. The problem is that there aren't any modern books there because all they want to do is hold on to the classics. Furthermore, many of these books are simply blocks of wood covered with expensive tooled leather binding so that the bookshelf actually looks as though it's a set of real books. But the rich owner doesn't read, nor does he spend much time teaching himself, learning, and developing the art and aesthetics needed to buy the estate he's living in. Here's from line, here, here are lines 127 to 140 in the epistle to Burlington. My lord advances with majestic mien, smit with a mighty pleasure to be seen. All he wants to do is show things off and have people admire his expensive taste. But soft by regular approach, not yet first through the length of yon hot terrace sweat. You have to go a long way to get to his house. You're even sweating when you get there. And when up ten steep slopes you've dragged your thighs, just at his study door, he'll bless your eyes. What are you going to see in his study, having walked up these long terraces to get to his home and to enter his study? His study... His study, with what authors is it stored? In books, not authors, curious is my lord. Through all their dated backs he turns you round. These Aldous printed, those do sale has bound. Lo, some are vellum, and the rest is good, for all his lordship, for all his lordship knows, but they are wood. For Locke or Milton, tis in vain to look. These shelves admit not any modern book. Now, all this is printing. I showed to you earlier in this session when you saw the magnificently printed pages. Whenever you see an Aldous book, you're likely to see a porpoise and an anchor on the cover. These, this is his printer's device, the way by which Aldous informed people that he was the printer and the engraver of the book. Dusail was a book binder. And the bindings are what would cover the blocks of wood in the rich man's home. And of course, Locke and Milton, while well, they seem old to you today, were very new. Pope wrote his poem in 1713. Locke was writing in the 1690s. And Milton, of course, wrote Paradise Lost in 1667. So these are modern writers, and uh, these rich people have no truck for them. They haven't been evaluated. They're only interested in the Greek and the Latin classics. Now here we have an example of the New Testament done by Elsevier, a famous bookbinder, the year is 1667 when Milton wrote Paradise Lost and when Jonathan Swift was born. This particular edition of the New Testament was banned by the church because of translations that they uh, were, not, were not acceptable. Here's an example of fine binding. Notice that the leather is brought around to the back of the front cover and tooled in gold. 
So someone has taken a special tool and drawn these flowers into it and then pressed gold leaf into the area. The page itself is an end page, or these are end sheets. This is a sheet that is pasted to the back of the book or to the cover of the book and then to the pages of the book so that they adhere together. Now marbleizing is a very, very expensive art. What the marbleizer did it does is take a tank of oils of different colors and start it spinning. And then he drops a sheet of paper into it. And the paper is covered by these oils and whatever configuration evolves. Then the paper is taken out with a unique design on it that's never repeated in any other end sheet. Today, of course, our end sheets are printed 100,000 at a time on a printing press, and every end sheet is exactly the same. But these are the kinds of fine books that you find in our special collections room in the second floor of the library and in rare, books, rare book libraries throughout the world. Some of you may be lucky enough to have old books at home with marbleized end sheets and tooled leather binding. Pope expresses his opinion of art. And he talks about the types of paintings that are being put into very fine homes. He says, and now the chapel's silver bell you hear that summons you all to the pride of prayer. Now in these homes of these fabulously wealthy people, they have chapels where they can go and pray themselves instead of going to church. And now the chapel's silver bell you hear that summons you all, that summons you to all the pride of prayer. How else can prayer be prideful unless people are showing off as they pray rather than praying earnestly, humbly, and keeping to themselves? Light quirks of music, broken and uneven, make the soul dance upon a jig to heaven. On painted ceilings you devoutly stare, where sprawl the saints of Vario or Laguerre. On gilded clouds in fair expansion lie, and bring all paradise before your eye. I'll read that one more time. On painted ceilings you devoutly stare, where sprawl the saints of Vario or Laguerre. On gilded clouds in fair expansion lie, and bring all paradise before your eye. These are the kinds of paintings that Pope did not like. Louis Laguerre designed uh, rooms for the music, uh, designed paintings for the music room at Chatsworth House, also for the ballroom at Burgley House, and for the salon at Blenheim Palace. Each of these pieces Pope dislikes because he doesn't like the angels of Vario or Laguerre. These become paintings on the ceiling at Chatsworth House. Mythical figures, angels with wings. See the angel over here? When you go to the Museum of Modern Art in Houston, when you yourself paint, how many putti how many angels do you put in your paintings today? To what 
in what ways can you express a religious spirit in your paintings? Well, Varian Laguerre did it with the imaginations of angels and heavenly creatures and mythical figures. Pope apparently didn't like any of it. Pope writes, but hark, the chiming clocks to dinner call, a hundred footsteps scrape the marble hall, the rich buffet, well-colored serpents grace, and gaping tritons spew to wash your face. Now, in order to understand what he's really talking about here, you've got to understand that he was referring to the home of the Duke of Chandos, a place called Cannons that had a hundred servants in it and more than 75 rooms. Chandos was such, had such an elaborate home at Cannons that one staircase alone cost almost 1,200 pounds to build with special wood, paintings of Laguerre on the wall, expensive candelabras hanging from the ceiling. The paintings alone cost around 754 pounds. The lantern itself cost close to 60 or 70. Remember, a parish priest was getting 50 pounds a year. A poor family could live on 5 to 15 pounds a year in England. The Archbishop of Canterbury was earning a thousand pounds a year. And here was the Duke of Chandos with 72 rooms and multiple staircases spending as much as $1,200 on but one staircase out of 72 items he was building. He also had 50 servants. And therefore, you get a hundred footsteps scrape the marble hall. Those are Shandos' 50 servants. Let me see if I can show you a picture of, of uh, Shandos' home. Give me one minute here to call it up. All right. Okay. Yes, thank you. Pardon me? Okay. Well. Oh, yes. Okay. Thank you. All right. I'm sorry. All right, here are some examples of cannons. This is the Shandos' home. Notice again the Palladian architecture. Notice that the arched doorway resembles our school of architecture. Notice the rounded windows, the roseate windows. And notice the statues on the pedestals. This gives you a sense of 
the size and the dimensions of of this helm. All these windows may have fronted one single ballroom or one single foyer, but behind it you have multiple rooms to look at and to think about. Let's go back to this, these lines, lines 151 to 54. But hark, the chiming clocks to dinner call, a hundred footsteps scrape the marble wall. Now look what Pope does here. He mentions the rich buffet, well-colored serpent's grace, and gaping triton spew to wash your face. Now what is he talking about? Well, at Hardy's home in Buckinghamshire, we find this particular table. Notice the tritons on the table. Notice they are serpents. And the top of the table you see here, here you see the base of the table, and the legs apparently are these serpents. But this design was also used in the 18th century to help wash your face. In some instances, these tails were hollow and spigots appeared at the mouths of the tritons, of the serpents. Servants would fill the basin above with water and people could wash their hands in this type of bathroom design or this type of washroom facility. Of course, there were no bathrooms in the 18th century until around 1794, 1795. But this is the kind of fixture that you could find in a house to wash yourself before dinner. All right, now I'm looking for a few other designs. How does Pope go about ending this poem? What type of philosophy does he give us? First of all, he reminds us again, again that he is himself an artist. He had studied with a man by the name of Jarvis, who had written, who had published a book of Don Quixote with Jarvis's drawings. And Pope mentions this. So quick retires each flying course. You'd swear Sancho's dread doctor and his wand were there. Between each act the trembling salvers ring from soup to sweet wine. And God bless the king. Now, since he mentions Don Quixote, Sancho's dread doctor, I'll show you a scene from Jarvis, his teacher's book, where you have Don Quixote looking and desiring the beautiful Dulcinea. And there's Don Quixote on the right and Dulcinea apparently resisting his advances at this point. Jarvis's drawings and Jarvis's engravings were celebrated portraits of Don Quixote. And the truth of the matter is that many of the novels in the 18th century are really considered Quixotic in nature. A set of episodes, each of which is a separate episode, but leading finally to the resolution of a peaceful plot. Let's move on.
what good does the rich man do in our society? How, do his, how does his money benefit others other than himself and his family? Pope writes, Yet hence the poor are clothed, the hungry fed, health to himself and to his infant's bread the laborer bears. What his hard heart denies, his charitable vanity supplies. Many years ago, when, the, when uh, uh, the city of Houston first wanted to build a hotel downtown near the convention center, they were looking for funds to build it. Well, they had millions of dollars worth of HUD money to provide housing for poor people, of people of low economic means. And someone came up with the idea that this money should form a trust or should be used to buy bonds to build the hotel. You could justify it, they said, because what you did was not give people homes or not pay the rent, but instead, by building the hotel, you would provide them jobs. And then they could go on with earned income to buy their own homes and to effect their own living. Pope is being sarcastic here. And anyone who believed that you should use HUD funds to build a high-level hotel, of course, would be considered foolish and could be satirized by poets in the present day. Yet hence the poor are clothed, the hungry fed, health to himself and to his infants bread the laborer bears. What his hard heart denies, his charitable vanity supplies. Pope goes on to talk about the kinds of architecture he has been celebrating in the Epistle to Burlington. Sometimes we just don't get the picture we'd like to get, even after having spent time putting it in. Okay, here we are. What does Burlington say? What is the purpose of building? What is the purpose of gardening? What is the purpose of aesthetics and following the rules of nature? He says, another age shall see the golden ear him brown the slope and nod on the parterre. We're going to see corn grown on these fine estates in the future when the estates themselves decay and are no longer used. Deep harvests bury all his pride has planned, and laughing Ceres reassume the land. Now, who is Ceres, and why is she laughing? Well, this is to some extent classical, and to some extent biblical. Those of you who eat cereal every morning pay tribute to the goddess of Ceres. Every time you crunch, on a Cheerios or cornflakes. Ceres celebrates your good fortune, your sustenance, your ability to invigorate yourself as the day begins. But laughing is from the Hebrew Scriptures. When Sarah learned at the age of 90 that she was pregnant, she laughed. Here's an old woman ready to give birth to a child. And so she called her child Isaac, which means laughter. And Sarah was like Mother Earth. Earth is a mother because it nurtures the seed and it flourishes with growth. And just as nature gives birth to seed and sees seed grows, Sarah 
happily gave birth to Isaac. And Pope is talking about the fact that the land and nature will reassert itself when the rich are no longer alive and when their estates have fallen into disuse. But he does like certain architects and certain landscape architects like himself. He says, Who then shall grace or who improve the soil? Who plants like Bathurst or who builds like Boyle? Tis use alone that sanctifies expense and splendor borrows all her rays from sense. The epistle to Burlington is a very impressive work and one you should familiarize yourself with. Because not only does it give you a sense of the poet's capability to write about current events, not only does it give you a sense to understand local politics, not only does it give you an appreciation of what is good art and what is poor art in the 18th century, but it gives you a sense of values. It helps you understand what are the standards for good conduct, what are the good standards for good architecture, what are the good standards for great art, what are the means by which people may modestly pursue fine works of art as opposed to those who ostentatiously build great palaces, buy expensive paintings, foster art exhibits that they themselves cannot understand. If you walk about the University of Houston campus, you understand that every time we put up a building, we are obliged to spend 1% of the building's worth in new artwork on campus. Look about this campus and see what kind of artwork we have. You'll enjoy Walking Men, the large stainless steel architect, a, 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 creatures walking away from the art building and the communications building. The new architecture in front of the wellness center. And see how much of it, how much of it you appreciate and see how much of it you think is in good taste and how much of it contributes to the milieu and climate of your life at the University of Houston. I would like to now turn to a poem that Pope wrote in despair. Pope, at one point in his life, became irritated, finally, with all those people who had criticized him. He was a very successful poet. He was a great poet in his time. He earned a great deal of money as a poet. But there are always critics who assailed him. Among them, Louis Tebold, who criticized his edition of Shakespeare and pointed out many faults in it. And I think I've already mentioned to you uh, the fact that Pope took Tebold's comments and when he published a second edition, incorporated most of them into the new edition, changing them. But he never gave, forgave Tebold for the public embarrassment, nor many other poets for embarrassing him during his lifetime. Some attacked him because of his size. Some attacked him when they found certain po po bits of poetry they could criticize. And he finally wrote a book called The Dunciad. The Dunciad was a tribute to the dunces of the world who tried to write poetry and tried to display their art and who were incapable of doing it. Pope expanded an earlier version of the Dunciad in 1741 where he tries to describe what it is that annoys him and what in, and in what manner the dunces of this world, the bad poets and bad artists, 
are destroying human taste, human understanding, and even religion. When he first published the Dunciad, Pope developed this scenario. The poet laureate of England had died, and the goddess of dullness was looking for a successor. She found him, Lewis Tebold, with his books piled up, ready to light them in a fire. And she rescued his books, which were dull, insipid, uninteresting, unbought. And she raised him to the level of the king of dunces. Later on, Pope sub substituted Kali Sibber, a playwright and a writer whom he disliked and ultimately disowned, of course. In the second book of the Dunciad, Pope has the epic games. He actually gives us a mock epic in which the poets are themselves running about. Among them poets, of course, was also a bookseller by the name of Edmund Curl. Curl was a pirate. He would pirate books written by others and sell them at a lower price without giving the author any remuneration. The story is told that Pope at one point issued a series of letters that he himself had written. They somehow appeared at Curl's bookstore, and Curl published them as Pope's letters. Pope denied having written them, and Curl found himself, I believe, with a loss at, the, at that time. The epic games become part of the Dunciad. And what kind of games are these? We find that some poets have to slog through sloughs of mud because they throw mud at their fellow poets. They sully the reputations of their fellow poets, like Pope. And so those who can run through the mud the fastest, those who can get, cover themselves with mud the most, become the winners in these epic contests. Of course, all these poets are trying to write the great epic poem. They're trying to write elevated poetry. They're trying to write the highest level of poetry you could possibly write. Pope translates this into a urinating contest, where the poets seek to see who can drive the highest arc, and that's to Pope, as good as, poetry, as, as the poetry they can write. It simply is human emission and human waste which will lose its value and which has a stench that violates human sensibility. In 1741, Pope published a fourth book to the Dunciad. And in this book, he was very much in despair. He seems to think that as he gets older, Taste becomes poorer. Writing becomes less disciplined. People become less civil to, them, to each other. Remember, he was part of the Scriblerus Club. He and Alexander, he and John Gay, who wrote The Beggar's Opera, he and Jonathan Swift, who wrote Gulliver's Travels and The Tale of the Tub. He and Dr. Arbuthnot, the Queen's physician. He and a poet by the name of Parnell. All combined for the purpose of writing works that would criticize Robert Walpole. Walpole ruled for 20, more than 20 years. And his image one thinks about when one reads the Dunciad, particularly the fourth book. What does the fourth book deal with? Hmm. 
nations are going down, says Pope, at line 72. And now had fame's posterior trumpet blown and all the nations summoned to the throne. The young, the old who feel her inward sway, one instinct seizes and transports away. None need a guide. By sure attractions led and strong impulse gravity of head. There's no thinking here. It's whatever impulse people have to write. Whatever impulse people have to publish. Line 115, Pope says, When dullness, when dullness, the goddess of dullness, when dullness smiling, thus revive the wits, but murder first, and mince them all to bits. They plagiarize. Look at lines 124. Leave not a foot of verse, a foot of stone, a page, a grave, that they can call their own. This is the goddess of Donus. But spread, my son, she says, your glory thin or thick, on passive paper or on solid brick. If you are going to write, spread your Donus throughout the land. The goddess of Donus is urging her wits, her poets, her novelists, her writers, her statesmen to spread the word. As we move to the end of the poem, turn to line, page, five, uh, page 762, line 595, where Pope says the world is going haywire. He says... Dullness is proud to add one monarch more. And princes are but things born for first ministers as slaves for kings. But dullness, dullness reigns to make one mighty dunciad of the land. Now what kind of land are we now experiencing? What kind of country are we now experiencing? More she had spoke, but yawned. This is the god of dullness. The goddess of dullness yawns because anything that's dull puts you to sleep. And here we have a long, extended, epic yawn. More had she had spoke, but yawned. All nature nods. What mortal can resist the yawn of gods? Churches and chapels instantly it reached. St. James is first, for leaden Gilbert preached, then caught the schools. The hall scarce kept awake, the convocation gaped but could not speak. People going to church are yawning and sleeping. People going to the synod are sleeping. No longer are they interested in prayers. No longer are they interested in the words. The words are leaden. The words are dreary. The words are typical and predictable. And who wants to sit to listen anymore to these dull words by dull ministers? Lost was the nation's sense, says Pope, nor could be found while the long, solemn unison went round. Wide and more wide it spread o'er all the realm. Even Polinaris nodded at the helm. Now, the world has gotten so bad that Polinaris, who stayed awake even when Ulysses' men were drowsy, affected by poppies, 
Polinaris who guided the ship of state when others were drowsy and unable to help. Polinaris himself is now getting sleepy in this dull, crazy, insipid, useless, injudicious, and unlearned world. The vapor, mild or each committee crept, unfinished treaties in each office slept. No one's fair signing treaties. Committees aren't doing their job. It's taking years to do what should be done in a short time. The vapor uh, <clears throat> and chiefless armies dozed out the campaign and navies yawned for orders on the main. Chiefless armies. No one's running these armies. No one's even campaigning. Remember Tolstoy gives us a bitter passage such as this in War and Peace, where when planning the battle, the generals are all sleeping because they know no matter what happens, the battle plan will never work out the way they hoped it would. Instead, they leave the planning up to lesser officers knowing that whatever they plan will be skewed by events of war. Navies yawn for orders on the main. Here we go. O oh, muse, says Pope, relate, for you can tell alone that wits have short memories and dunces none. Relate who first, who last resigned to rest, whose heads she partly, whose completely blessed, who are, some, who are half fools and who are full fools. What charms could faction, what ambition lull the, venet, the venal quiet and entrance the dull? So ambition now is affected by dullness. Till drowned was sense. Remember in the epistle to Burlington, he says what we need is good sense. Now he says what is drowned is good sense. Till drowned was sense and shame and right and wrong O oh, sing and hush the nation with thy song while the great mother bids Britannia sleep and pours her spirit o'er the land and deep dullness is taking over. Now, we go into this epic simile as Pope begins to mention all the situations where dullness takes over. It isn't just in the government. It isn't in the committee, only in the committees. It isn't in the armies. And it isn't in the navies. In vain, in vain, the all-composing hour resistless falls. The muse obeys the power. The muse now is obeying dullness. Not Homer's creativity, but the god of dullness in the 18th century. She comes, she comes, the sable throne behold of night primeval and of chaos old. Now Pope is reversing biblical imagery. Genesis saw the creation of a new world. Genesis saw the light. Genesis saw the sun and the stars. Genesis saw the creation of man. And all this came out of chaos. There was chaos and God ordered the world. Well, Pope is now telling us the ordered world has now fallen to dull people, dull politicians, dull poets, dull parents, dull artists, dull politicians. Before her fancies gilded clouds decay and all its varying rainbows die away. The rainbow shows us the many facets of colors. And fancy is the imagination in the mind. Well... Fancy dies away, and so do the rainbows of the prism that Newton introduced us to. No more learning. Wit shoots it in vain its momentary fires. The meteor drops and in a flash expires. As one by one at dread Medea's strain, 
the sickening stars fade off the ethereal plane. Classical imagery to indicate that those who want destruction are gaining their wishes. As Argus's eyes, by Hermes' wand oppressed, closed one by one to everlasting rest. Argus had a hundred eyes. Each one is now closing as the world, says Pope, succumbs to dullness. Art after art goes out, and all is night. See skulking truth to her old cavern fled. See skulking truth to her old cavern fled. Mountains of casuistry heaped o'er her head. Casuistry is religious thought that allows you to practice whatever you want and believe whatever you want by manipulating words or by manipulating theory or by ignoring, ignoring the text and almost rewriting it yourself. Casuistry allows you to do whatever you want even though it may be against the law because you can justify it by inverting or reverting to the law or altering the significance of the law. Philosophy that leaned on heaven before shrinks to her second cause and is no more. Physic of metaphysic begs defense and metaphysic calls for aid on sense. Metaphysics is the ethereal world, the religious world. You're looking for sense, but there's no one willing to deliver this sense. In vain they gaze, turn giddy, rave, and die. Where do we see dullness creeping in? Certainly in television. Certainly in television news, which is more fluff than it is news. You get two or three minutes of international news and then you go on to a half a dozen burglaries and a half a dozen police shoot I mean a half a dozen shootings that the police must follow up on and then a half a dozen uh, people who are burning down homes or hurting their abusing their wives. That's what the news is all about. Very little education just a lot of people engaged in terribly dull activity proving themselves inexorably dull. Pope goes on. Religion blushing veils her sacred fires. Religion is now shamed. Gibbon in the decline and fall of the Roman Empire was to later say religion came down from heaven a beautiful shining woman to be turned into a prostitute by the people of the world. Pope says, religion blushing veils her sacred fires and unawares morality expires. No public flame nor private dares to shine. There is no imagination anymore. Nor human spark is left nor glimpse divine. There is no genius celebrating itself in the world. As we saw in the epistle to Burlington with Bathurst and Boyle. Pope concludes by saying, Lo, thy dread empire chaos is restored. Light dies before thy uncreating word. Thy uncreating word, remember the word first gave us light. Let there be light. Now we have no word and we have no light. Thy hand, great anarch, referring to Donus, says Pope, lets the curtain fall and universal darkness buries all. That is, we're now back to the reversal of the biblical coda where we had darkness and light separated to create the world. Now we revert to darkness, dullness, and Pope's disappointment with his England, with his fellow poets, and perhaps at this point with his life. Thank you.